Well, let's get into the word. Are you ready to get into God's word? Okay, I'm going to do a three-part message. Um, now, if you look at our, where is the backdrop? Please bring it all up. Okay, thank you. Now, if you look at our backdrop, you, you see that um, uh, on the extreme left corner, that's your, is it your left or my right? Well, the corner over there. Uh, there is uh, a picture of a chariot going up and a mantle dropping. That is Elijah going on and his mantle dropping uh, down. And when we, you look at our declaration uh, every week, we say that I receive the mantle of leadership. So that's what I'm going to focus on on my teaching. And it's going to take three parts uh, to, to talk about that. So my message, uh, the theme uh, is from Elijah to Elisha. From Elijah to Elisha. And the subtitle is Becoming a Servant. From Elijah to Elisha. And the subtitle is Becoming a Servant. The story of Elijah and Elisha shows how a leadership anointing can be passed from one person to the other. It's not the only case of leadership impartation in the scripture, as we'll read. Uh, there are other examples from Moses to Joshua, Paul, Timothy, and of course Elijah and Elisha. And I'm going to do three parts in this uh, series. Today, I'll be focusing on becoming a servant, and the next part will be becoming a student, and the next part will be becoming a son. It is a process of graduation by which we are able to receive uh, the anointing from one level to the other. So there are going to be three scriptures we start with. The first is in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9. The second is in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 15. And then we'll read Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Deuteronomy 34, verse 9. 2 Kings 2, verse 15. Philippians 2, 19 to 22. And so let's start with Deuteronomy 34 verse 9. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. For Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. Very important commentary. Then 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 15. This is after Elijah had departed, says, Now when the sons of the prophets who were, with, who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to him and bowed to the ground before him. The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Then Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I may also be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know this, his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me, he served with me in the gospel. Now, over the period of my teaching, I'll be making uh, references to Joshua and to Timothy, but I'll be focusing my teaching on Elijah and Elisha. So take note of the 
uh, the one concerning Elijah and Elijah, Second Kings chapter 2, verse 15. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. One of the things you'll notice about God is that he doesn't start mass production. God doesn't start doing things in mass production. When he was creating the human race, he didn't create a thousand people at a time or a million people at a time. We now have about seven and a half billion people on this planet, but God didn't create a billion people at a time. He created one man. And out of the one man, he took the woman, and then out of them, he produced all of us. When God wanted to build the nation of Israel, he didn't create a thousand people or build a thousand people at the same time, but then he uh, raises uh, Abraham, and out of Abraham comes Isaac, and out of Isaac, Jacob and Esau, and out of Jacob, the 12 sons will become the 12 tribes, and so on and so forth. So God will always create a prototype and multiply it. And it goes with the, the thing about leadership that God will always create a prototype and multiply it. And the process of multiplying that prototype is what we are going to look at today. Now, when we look at the passage concerning Elijah, the passage says the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. It's quite an interesting uh, way of expressing it. The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. So what does the word spirit in that context mean? The word spirit there means abilities, aptitudes, and wisdom. Ability, aptitude, and wisdom. When we say aptitude, it is the frame of mind, the way they, they look at the world, and their wisdom, the way they act. So the ability of Elijah rested on Elisha. The aptitude of Elijah rested on Elisha. And the wisdom of Elijah was manifested in Elisha. So it's possible to inherit great leadership attributes from one person to the other. So three important things I want to state. First is that the spirit of a leader is transferable. The spirit of a leader is transferable. Moses transferred what he had to Joshua. Elijah transferred what he had to Elisha. Paul transferred what he had to Timothy. The spirit of a leader is transferable. Second, there are processes for transferring the spirit of a leader. There are processes for doing that. Certain people are able to receive, others are not able to. To receive now if you uh if i would just fast forward uh elisha was able to receive from elijah however elisha's seven gehazi could not receive from elisha so some are able to receive the transference and others are not able to receive it and third statement receiving the spirit of a leader enables us to do what they do it's not enough just to admire a person. It's important that the abilities that you admire are replicated in your life. So if I say that, oh, I admire this person so much, maybe I say I admire Billy Graham or I admire some other leader, it's great to admire them, but the most important thing is that I should be able to do what they do. I should be able to replicate uh, what they do. So leadership is not just to be admired. It has to be replicated. And if there is anything every leader desires, including myself, it's not just to be admired by people, but to see a lot of people replicating the skills, the abilities that they admire. And each one of us must determine, not just be admirers of a mentor but also to replicate what they have and what they stand for so let's go to the scripture now to 
look at the Elijah, Elisha situation and where this whole thing started from. So 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 to 21. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 to 21. This is God giving instruction to Elijah on what to do uh, from this point on in his life and his ministry. And he reads, Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael, as king over Syria. And also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Now I want you to note the word anoint. It's used three times in all the three uh, uh, situations. Verse 17. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to bow, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, well, what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and bore their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Very interesting. Elijah is a prophet, and he's an, uh, instructed to anoint two kings and one prophet. The king of Syria, king of Israel, and a prophet. Very interesting, because Syria is not under Israel, but the prophet's ministry uh, extended beyond his country. So he was going to annoy the king of another country, Syria, then Israel, then a prophet. Now, if you look through the scriptures, there is no record. There is no record that Elijah anointed any of the three. He didn't anoint Hazael. He didn't directly anoint uh, Jehu. And he didn't anoint Elisha. If we take anointing to be literally the pouring on of oil. Uh, because, you know, many times people uh, will come and say, you know, pastor, just pour this oil upon me and impart your anointing upon me. Uh, and, and there are people who have sometimes come to my office with their own oil. In other words, for the avoidance of doubt, if you don't have oil, we come fully supplied. And, and, and they say, you know, would you anoint us? And they come with their own oil. And they will kneel down and say, pour this oil upon us. And, and we will be anointed. And, and what you carry will rest upon us. And, and many times, you know, sometimes people have more faith than yourself. And you know, I will just, I will just you know, oil you, but nothing is going to happen. Because this is not how it happens. It's not just the pouring on of oil. There's something deeper. So if you look at it. God says anoint, but really he didn't pour oil on anybody. Even Elisha, who received his anointing, was not anointed with oil. He received it through a process. And that's the process I want to talk about. Because if you don't understand the process, you will go for symbols. Because many times we are rushing for symbols and not substance. And these days, you know, anointing oil has replaced every process. So we want to buy a car, we'll go and anoint the car. 
You want to buy land, you put oil on the land. Uh, you want uh, uh, whatever do you want. I don't know what you want. But people believe that just by smearing something with oil, there is a magical process that brings about transfers of power. The process is deeper than just the symbol. So when you look at the dealings with Elijah and Elisha, you realize although no oil is poured on Elisha, there is a transfer. There is a transfer that takes place. Now, the first thing I want us to note out of the passage we read is what Elijah did. What Elijah did. Elijah's actions. After Elijah was instructed by God, he did three very important things. Three very important things. First is that he discovered Elisha. He went looking for Elisha based on God's leading. Now we're not told whether they knew each other ahead of time, but it is very possible that Elijah knew Elisha ahead of time. It's very possible that probably Elisha was a student in the school of prophets that Elijah was running. It's likely, but the, the scripture doesn't say so. But if you look at the, the nature of the instruction where his name is mentioned, his father's name is mentioned, it seems like somebody who was already known to Elijah. So, but he goes looking for him. So he discovers him. The mentor discovers the mentee. He discovered and located Elisha. Now at the time when Elijah finds Elisha, he's not prophesying. He's plowing. Now, isn't it strange that God says go and anoint a prophet and you go looking for the guy and the guy is a farmer. It looked like the wrong gift in the wrong place. But it tells us that sometimes potential can be found in the most unlikely places. So, if God says go look for a prophet, and in those days there were sons of the prophets, you would expect that Elisha or Elijah will go to the sons of the prophets and maybe Elisha will already be somebody who is training to be a prophet. It's possible, but it's not stated. What is stated clearly is that he's a farmer. He's a farmer with the potential of a prophet. That's the first thing. But Elijah discovers him. Talent can sometimes be hidden in very obscure places. People you don't think have ability have ability. People you don't think can do much will do much. And so God instructs Elijah, and he finds the man farming. That's the first thing. Second thing Elijah did is that he threw his mantle on Elisha. We like that a lot. Throwing the mantle. The mantle was not the spirit. It was an indication of what will happen later to Elisha. The mantle was an outer piece of garment that Elijah was was identified with. Now, it is very obvious when you read this passage that the mantle was not left with Elisha. Because later on, the mantle was given to him again. So, when this mantle is thrown to him, it isn't thrown to him and left with him. It's, It's almost like the mantle was used to touch him. So Elijah, Elijah just threw the mantle, touched him, but kept it. Because at this time, it didn't belong to Elisha. It belonged to Elijah. So there is a temporary moment when he has an impartation that shows him what he can be. But it's not permanent in him. He receives a mantle or the mantle is thrown against him. Third thing about Elijah is that he allowed Elisha to decide the way forward for himself. He didn't put him under pressure. In fact, throughout their relationship, 
Elijah made every conscious effort to discourage Elijah, Elisha. Elijah just made sure he never encouraged him. He discouraged him. From when he says, uh, let me go and uh, say goodbye to my parents, he says, what have I done to you? In other words, it's up to you. It's up to you. I have just shown you that you could be a prophet, but it's up to you. You can decide to continue being a farmer. You can decide to follow me. You can decide to stay. You can decide to kiss your parents. Whatever you want to do is up to you because leadership is not by force. The anointing is not by force. You have to be ready to receive it. So, he allowed him to decide. And later when you read the encounters between Elijah and Elisha, you realize almost every step of the way, Elijah tried to discourage Elisha. Many times people say, well, you know, uh, you know sometimes people say, you know, I, I want you to train me. I want you to, to help me. I, I want to be like you. The first instruction you give them, they don't take it. They don't take it. Because... They want you to encourage them. You know, um, I, I remember uh, one of the old movies uh, I watched. It's called The Karate Kid. How many of you watch Karate Kid? Okay, I know some of you are too holy. You don't watch <coughs> Karate Kid. And this kid goes to, uh, you know, martial arts expert or kung fu expert to, to teach him how to fight. And he gives him a duster. And tells him to dust one way. And, and so the guy comes with a duster and he's dusting the car. And every time he goes one way, this way, and this way, and that way, and this way. And he does it for days and he's wondering, what has dusting this way and that way got to do with fighting martial arts? I came here to learn how to fight. So eventually the master taught him that he was training him how to block blows how to block this way and that way and re, you know develop the ability the reflexes sometimes the lessons you learn to become whom you must become doesn't seem to relate to what you are looking for and so you start the process you want to be a prophet you want to be taught how to say that says the lord but that's not how it works so he receives the mantle and Elijah just leaves him to make his decisions. Now, let's look at Elisha's responses. How did Elisha respond to this moment of encounter with Elijah? And in, 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 in the story we hear about Elisha, there are six important attributes that stand out from the character of Elijah. First is that Elisha was a very resourceful person. The passage says that he was plowing with 12 oxen. He was an entrepreneur. Most likely he was in a family business and he had people working for him. In the passage we are told that he is plowing 12 oxen and the 12th is with him. Now what that literally means, you can't, you can't plow 12 by yourself. So there are 11 other people plowing and he's doing the number 12. So if for nothing, he's employing 11 people. But most likely he's employing more than that. And if he's plowing with 12 oxen, it means he's plowing a large field. He was engaged in work. He was entrepreneurial. He was resourceful. He was committed to doing something. God doesn't use lazy people to do his work. Did you notice that all the people that Jesus called as disciples were already doing something? You're either balancing an accounts book or they were mending a, a, some nets or they were fishing, but they were always doing something. Not people standing doing nothing, looking for a job. You know, many times people think that uh, if, if you don't know what to do, then you, you can be a pastor. 
I've actually had people come to me and say, you know, can you, can you help my brother? You know, he, he's just at home. He, he's not doing anything. Can you, can you help him to be a pastor? Now, if he's doing nothing at home and he becomes a pastor, he'll do nothing too. Because people who do nothing will do nothing. One of the worst things you, you can tell somebody when you're looking for a job is to say, you know, I'm sitting at home, I'm doing nothing. Can you give me a job? Now, if you tell me that, I will not give you a job. But if you say, I'm sitting at home, I have no job, but this is what I've been doing, I've been working, I've been, I've been trying to do this and do that and do that, then I know that you are entrepreneurial, you are resourceful, you are somebody who can do something out of nothing. But if you are sitting at home doing nothing, who wants to give you a job? And please, all of you who employ people, don't give anybody a job who is doing nothing. So if somebody comes to an interview, you ask him, what are you doing? Nothing. So what do you do? I'm at home. What do you do? Nothing. Where have you been to? Uh, I've, I've got this degree, and I've got that degree, and I've got MBA, and I've got it. And what are you doing? Nothing. Now, if you employ such a person, well, that's up to you. So God is going to use Elisha. First sign is that he's resourceful. He is committed. He's plowing with 12 oxen. Second thing you note about Elisha is that he's receptive. He's receptive. The moment the mantle touches him, the Bible says he left his oxen and ran after Elijah. He was not told whether to run or to stay. But he was receptive. He was receptive to this moment of destiny. He left what he was doing and he pursued Elijah. Third, he was responsible. He was responsible. How do we know? He sought permission to separate from his parents. He worked in the family business. The family trusted him. His parents trusted him with 12 oxen and, and other employees. Now he's going to change vocation. He doesn't just take off. He said, let me go and settle accounts with my parents, then I can come follow you. Whenever God is shifting you from one season to the another, one place to the other, it's important that you leave your back well. If you get a new job, go tell your former boss, sir, I've gotten a new job and I'm moving on. Don't just, one Monday, you're supposed to show up. There's an assignment for you, you don't show up. That's irresponsibility. If you believe you must move on, go and settle with a place where you are committed. So he was responsible. He sought permission to separate from his parents. Fourth, he was resolute. He killed his oxen and burnt their equipment. In other words, he made sure I'm through with this farming. I'm not going to be a farmer again. I'm responding to this call. He was very determined. A very determined and resolute person. Killed the oxen, burned their equipment. Number five, he readjusted. He readjusted. He fed people with the meat of his oxen. He demonstrated that from that time onwards, his focus would not be working to feed himself. He's going to work to feed other people. All this time, his focus has been work and make my life better. But from now on, he's going to work to make other people's lives better. So he burnt his oxen and fed people with it. It showed where his ministry was going to be. He readjusted his focus from feeding himself to feeding other people. And number six, he was respectful. He followed Elijah and became his servant. He followed Elijah and became his servant. He moved from being the boss of his farm workers to becoming the servant of Elijah. 
Now, if you were observing this, you would say, the guy has stepped down. He has gone lower. Eleven people look up to you. You have farm workers. You have your own business. You're doing well by yourself. Why do you lower yourself? And I'm sure if Elijah was, Elisha was a Ghanaian, he would have a lot of people come to him and say, are you in your right mind? Are you thinking? Look at all that you have. Look at all that you've achieved. Now, wh why are you doing this? Why, why have you gone to be somebody's small boy or small girl? They, they, never, they never say small girl. They always say small boy. Why are you doing boy, boy, not girl, girl? Because there will always be people who will criticize certain moves you make and make you feel as if you lost your brain. Here you are, people look up to you, you are a boss in your own right, there are 11 people who look up to you, you have a field you are plowing, you're doing well as a businessman, one day you are sitting here somewhere, this guy comes, hits you with a mantle, and you leave everything, kill the, your, your, your oxen, that you are plowing with, feed people with it, cut links with your past, and you don't even go to be an associate. You go to be a servant. But that is the unique thing about Elisha. Because if there's going to be a transference, the first thing that starts is the spirit of a servant. Not the spirit of a master, the spirit of a servant. So Elisha turned back from him. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Now what does it mean that he became his servant? It means several things. First, it means he surrendered his own agenda. Many who seek to receive the mantle of leadership never surrender their own agenda. They stay around the person they want to receive from with their own agenda. Always looking for an occasion to advance their own interests. And Gehazi was a clear example. Judas was a clear example. People who are seeking their own agenda. But Elisha became his servant. He surrendered his own agenda. Not only did he surrender his own agenda, he submitted himself to Elijah. And that was a willing choice. It was not forced on him. It was not demanded from him. Elijah did not ask for loyalty or submission. But Elisha chose to be a servant. He submitted himself. In the process of becoming a leader, there will always be a time of submission. There will always be a time of submission. There will be, always be a time of surrender. One of the reasons why it's difficult sometimes in certain cultures for there to be progressive leadership is because people don't understand what it is to serve. There's always a personal agenda. There's always a desire for personal interest. And there is lack of submission. Thirdly, to become his servant, he shouldered Elijah's burden. He made it easier for Elijah to do his work. He made sure that Elijah would not carry his burden alone. He did for Elijah what Elijah couldn't do for himself or what was weighing him down. He took on that burden. And fourthly, he became his servant 
because he supported Elijah's vision or his interest. He took sides with Elijah. Elijah's battles became Elisha's battles. Elijah's enemies became Elisha's enemies. You cannot be on different sides with your master. You cannot say, well, that's his position, but this is mine. If there's anything I have observed, you know, working in different places or observing people in different places, is that, you know, in different cultures, and I don't know whether it's absolutely true, but in different cultures, if you go to uh, some of the advancing economies, and I don't want to mention their name because I don't want them to feel too big, uh, but you go to these advanced economies and you go to somebody who works in a department store. And I won't mention the name of any store because I'm not promoting them. But you go to a department store in some country and you just pick a shop assistant and start talking to them about where they work. And you'll be amazed the enthusiasm with which they speak. They praise their corporate organization. They know the vision of where they are working. They, 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 they speak highly of their products. They compare their products with other competitors. And they always insist their products are the best. And they go on and on and on. They talk about their bosses. And they are speaking highly of their bosses. And I've seen that in several countries. But in, in most of our, our environments. When somebody works in a place and you ask them opinion, there's going to be complain, 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 complain. And undermining. Sometimes they undermine their own product. Their own organization. They speak against it, speak against the boss, speak against everybody else. I think it's one of the reasons why it's difficult to pass on successive success stories from one generation to the other in our part of the world. Because there is an undermining mindset with which we work. That wasn't Elijah's and Elijah's relationship. Elisha shouldered the responsibilities of Elijah, pursued his interest. And if you look at his, their relationship, there were great opportunities for Elisha to turn against Elijah and criticize him and fight him, but he never did because he had his mind to receive a double portion. He wanted to be greater than the previous generation. If this generation will be greater than the previous generation, then our attitude has to be different. We cannot continue undermining everything and gaining from it at the same time. You cannot benefit from something you disrespect. And the culture of respect is critical to succession. If there is no respect, there will be no passing on. And we see in Elijah, in Elijah, we are not told who is older and who is younger. But it's likely that Elijah was older. But you know, the Bible later says Elijah was bald. So we don't know whether old age bald or grown bald, but... We're not told their ages, but we will assume fairly that probably Elijah was older. But this guy was already an established guy. And he works in this organization and he's not complaining. How many of us can say, this is where I work and I'm just happy. And I speak well of my place of work. Anytime a leader finds people whose hearts are joined to his vision, it's easy for whatever they carry to be transferred to those people. Elisha 
obviously supported Elijah's interest. He didn't have an opinion that was different from what Elijah had. So in what, in how was he a servant? Now we're not told too much about how he served Elijah. But in 2 Kings chapter 3 verse 11, we find an indication there that gives us a clue as to what it meant when he says that he served him. This is when they were looking for a prophet. Elijah is long gone and Elisha is on the scene. And it says, but Jehovah's, Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord from him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Note that phrase, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. So this passage tells us how Elisha served. He poured water on the hands of Elisha. He focused on the man Elijah and not on his gift. He poured water on his hands. He washed Elijah's, Elijah's hand and not his own hand. His attention was serving him. And if you look at the passage, he, wasn't, he didn't go in first to learn how to prophesy. He went in just to meet the man's physical needs. Wash his things, wash his clothes, wash his hands. Uh, in our part of the world, we'll say, iron his clothes and, and do what we call menial job, polish his shoes. Did you say you want to be a prophet? Yes. Why are you polishing shoes? Is that prophecy? But the first step for Elisha was servanthood. Servanthood. The step for greatness starts with servanthood. And it, it jives with what Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25 and 26. Jesus called to them, servant says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to be great among you. Let him be your servant. How many, how many of you really want to be great? Okay. Now he didn't say if you want to be great. Go and print a, a card. With your name on it. And your titles on it. He says, he didn't say if you want to be great, go and sell yourself. You know, these days we believe in marketing yourself. Go and sell yourself. And when people say sell yourself, it means speak more highly of yourself than you ought to. Have you read the kinds of CVs or resumes that people put out these days? And they talk about, you know, I'm able to do enterprise-wide this, and I, I'm a good team player, and I'm this, and I'm that. And, and it's so nicely written. And the question is, if you are all of this, why are you that? <laughs> Don't you think, I mean, if you were as good as the paper says you were, you wouldn't be sitting in front of me looking for this job. You'll be the best thing since chocolate. Everybody will be out there looking for you, but we are in an age of self-promotion. And people promote themselves beyond their abilities. But Jesus says if you're going to be great, you don't promote yourself. He says you have to be a servant. That's what Elisha understood. The way to greatness is through service. The way up is down. Can you imagine the kind of work environment we'll have and the kind of people we'll produce if young men and women became Elisha's and entered into a workforce with the attitude of Elisha? In Luke chapter 16 verse 12, Jesus says, And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Two important concepts. Servanthood is the path to greatness. And stewardship is the key to ownership. If you've not been faithful, if you've not been a steward of another man's, 
who will give you your own. A path to leadership, impartation, starts with being a servant. And that is where Elisha started with. Now, as we will learn later on, he later received a double portion of what Elijah had. In other words, he became greater in terms of the volume of his work and activity. He became greater than his master. But he didn't start by just desiring greater. He started by serving. And especially for our young men and women. I know you are very hungry for success. And it's good to be hungry for success. But if you're going to be great, you're going to serve. If you're going to receive a double portion, you're going to serve. I told you the story years ago of a young man who came to see me. Well, I was young at that time and he was young too. But I had been in ministry for a while and had a pretty successful church. You know, uh, those were the early days when we were in Bidding Power Hall. We had a couple of thousand people. At least uh, by those standards, we were doing quite well. And this guy came to me and told me that God had told him that he would be greater than me. Some people are very bold. I mean, if even if God has told you that, don't tell me. <laughs> Keep it to yourself. But he sat in front of me and said, God told me that I'll be greater than you. I said, wow. And what else did he say? And he said, God told me to tell you that whatever you are doing is an introduction to what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm not lying. I'm telling you the truth. Absolute truth. He said, what you're doing is an introduction of what I'm going to do. And he's sitting in front of me telling me that. I said, wow, I'm in trouble. My replacement has already been found. And I'm very young in ministry. And then he said, you, God said, you are my John the Baptist. In other words, he's Jesus, I'm John. <laughs> so he's already put himself in the place of Jesus. I said, wow. A greater than, <laughs> than John is sitting in front of me. And then he started talking about my ministry and all the things I'm not doing right and all the mistakes. And, and he says, you, you could do this and you can do this and you are not doing this. And, and, and I'm patiently listening to him. And he's just rattling all of these things and qu quoting scripture in addition. I was very patient, you know, because I, who knows? This is Jesus and, you know, I may miss my, the rapture if I don't listen to him. So I said, let me listen. So he went on and told me about all the things God had told him to do and the kind of church he's going to have and, and how big his church will be and, and all of that. But, you know, at the back of my head, I was saying, I mean, let's face it. At this point in time, I've done far more than you have done. So even if you will be greater, don't you think you should come and ask me humble questions? Don't you think you would say, listen, I, I, in my back of my mind, I know I'll be greater than you. But let me start studying what you have. At least you have done something more than me. So let me study. Let me learn from. Let me ask questions. Let me learn. He wasn't learning. He was teaching me. So I started waiting for his greatness to manifest. That year, I didn't see much. Then he started a church. And may God forgive me for telling this story. He started a church. So I said, ah, the great one has started. <laughs> Jesus has started his church. <laughs> Let's see how it will go. So I watched, you know, a year later, two years later, I saw him. I said, how is the church going? He said, well, you know, God is doing great things. God is doing great things. People are coming. How many people? We have just about... 10, 15 people, but you know, God is doing great things. Don't despise the days of small beginnings. I said, I'm not despising, you know. Five days, years later, how, how are things going? Oh, things are still moving. You know, God is still doing his thing. God is still doing his thing. So I lost contact with him. And I, about 20 years later, I asked, so 
when did God do his thing? I asked a friend of his, I said, what happened to this young man? He's abandoned church, didn't work. Apparently, Jesus didn't show up. And he, he's actually left the ministry doing something else. And yet he starts, sat in front of me and never asked me one question about how I got to where I got to. At least if I've gotten to 2,000 and you want to get to 4,000, don't you think you should know how I got to 2,000? Then you, you would know how to get to four. But you are from zero and you don't even want to inquire anything from me. Don't you think you should come and sit in my ministry and learn a few things and come to me and learn a few things from me and let me impart some wisdom to you? It may not be accurate wisdom. It's still John the Baptist's wisdom. It may not be up to Jesus. But don't you think John the Baptist was necessary? And, and Jesus had to base his ministry on John? So for most of you young people who are so highly minded that you believe you're going to be greater than everything that has come ahead of you, if you want to be the Elisha who does a double of what the Elijahs are doing, you start where Elisha started. You start with being a servant. You're going to serve somebody. You're going to pour water on somebody's hand. You're going to learn. You're going to throw away your own ambitions. You're going to kill your own oxen. You're going to distribute the flesh of your oxen. You're going to burn your own implements. And you're going to submit to an Elijah and say, I've done so much by myself, but I want to do far more. And you are the key to the far more. And I choose to serve under you. That is the beginning of of greatness you do it with sincerity you do it with integrity you do it without complaining you do it shouldering the burden you do it with respect and over time the double portion will rest upon you for this generation which wants to do double portion this is your key to greatness start with elisha and out of elisha you'll find your way forward god bless you